welcome to Grace Point Fellowship. A uh, special welcome if you are joining us via the internet, if you are watching our streaming service. Uh, right now, we just want to take a moment to, uh, uh, again, open our, our service in a word of prayer. So let's just bow our heads and pray together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. What a beautiful day, a beautiful week we've had. But God, uh, we recognize that in all things you work for the good of those who love you. We thank you that you care about each of us as individuals, as our families, and also as a church community. We thank you for our church family. And God, we just pray right now that as we uh, come to you to worship you, recognizing, God, that you are good. You've expressed your love to us in that you have sent your son, Jesus Christ, uh, to teach us about who you really are, your great love, sacrificial love, that you gave your life for us. We thank you. And so we worship you. Uh, we lift our prayers to you. God, we have a lot to pray for. Uh, we recognize and we bring to you uh, our needs. God, we uh, are tired of this whole COVID thing. And we uh, pray, God, that you would bring relief, uh, that you would uh, just uh, heal people, that you would uh, help us to get past this thing. But in the midst of it all, God, that we would be drawn to you and recognize that we need you, God. We need you. And so, God, I pray that uh, as we continue with our service, you will speak to us. Those that are here, those that are watching on their computers, God, uh, reveal to us your plan. Reveal to us who you are, that it's your desire to be with us, that you would be our God and we would be your people. And so, God, we commit ourselves, we open our hearts to hear from you this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand and join us as we come this, su this Sunday morning, uh, a celebration of Advent. You know, we are celebrating, you know, God with us, Jesus Christ with us in the midst of, you know, this COVID, in the midst of... Uh, fear and anxiety, uh, all these things, God is with us and he, he walks with us and what an amazing gift and that's what we have to celebrate uh, each and every day and so I invite you to come. Uh, this is a new song, it's called God With Us.
fix our eyes on Jesus. He's the hope of the nations. Hope of the nations, Jesus, hope of the nations, Jesus, comfort for all who mourn. You are the source of heaven's hope on earth. Jesus, light in the darkness, Jesus. Once again, uh, good morning. Welcome to Grace Point Fellowship. Great to see you all here. And as we come together to celebrate uh, so many things, uh, really, we celebrate uh, communion today together. Uh, we are in the second week of, of Advent, and uh, I love Advent. I love the Christmas season and all that, uh, uh, all that it, well, not, it's more than just symbolizing. It's, uh, we remember, uh, as, as last week, the first week of Advent, we lit a candle remembering hope. And uh, in our world today, we need hope so much. And, and today, uh, the second week of Advent, we remember preparation. Uh, a simple word, preparation. But it's God's call for us, His people, to be prepared. And we light the second candle now, remembering His call on us to be ready. Last week, we talked about that verse uh, spoken by the prophet Isaiah, to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everla Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. But that, that hope, 
that, that hope that we have, it's not a passive thing. It's not something we're supposed to, oh, oh, good, yeah. God's going to take care of everything. I can just sit back and relax. And sometimes I think that's the way we are with our faith. We think, oh, yeah, yeah, God will take care of things. I can relax. But we're told, uh, Isaiah, a little bit further on, uh, we're told, uh, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3 to 5, he says this about the coming of the king. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So it kind of makes more sense, right? Uh, we, Jesus Christ, God came in flesh. He went away and said, I'm coming again. This first time it was to teach you about love and to give my life for the world. For God so loved the world that all who believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. But he said, I'm coming again. And when I come this next time, you know, it's the return of the king. And he comes to reign. And everything is going to be changed. The glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it. And we have to ask the question then, how then shall we live? How will we be re- prepared? Uh, one of my favorite uh, movies and even, well, sorry, it's actually not one of my favorite movies. It's one of my favorite books, though, The Lord of the Rings. And in the last part of it, uh, which is called The Return of the King, uh, one of my favorite characters, uh, Farmer, his name is, and he was struck down by evil, and then when the king returns, he's healed. And I'm just going to read this little quote from that passage. It says this, Suddenly Faramir stirred, and he opened his eyes, and he looked on to Aragorn, who was the king, who bent over him, and the light of knowledge and love was kindled in his eyes. And he spoke softly, My Lord, you called me, I come. What does the king command? And he said, Walk no more in the shadows, but awake, said Aragorn. You are weary. Rest a while, take food, and be ready when I return. I will, Lord, said Faramir, for who would lie idle when the king has returned? I love that line. Who would lie idle when the king has returned? And Christ came, God in flesh came, to give his life for us, a sacrifice for us whom he calls his friends. No greater love can anybody show than to lay his life down like that. And so it is with us. Jesus has come, he's conquered death, and he said, I will return. How can we lie idle? How can we lie idle when our king is coming back soon? As we come to the communion table this morning, let's ask this question of ourselves. Are we prepared? Am I prepared? Do I stand ready? Are we prepared, preparing a way for our King's return? We do this by making our hearts right. We do this by, as we live in this world, as we walk with our families and friends, we do this by just searching our hearts, say, hey, am I walking with God? Am I his, just like Faramir was, am am I his servant ready to respond? When he uh, brings something to my attention, when we look around and we see the needs in the world, are we responding and and saying, yes, Lord, you've sent me, here I am, I'll go. When we see a brother and sister in need who's uh, discouraged, who's lonely, do we step and say, yes, my king, I'm ready, where will I go? And That's what communion is about, too. We we light this candle. We lit this candle remembering that we are to be prepared. But it's what communion is about, too. Uh, In 1 Corinthians 11, 23, we read this. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread 
and drink from the cup. So let's take a moment right now to examine our hearts and to be prepared. Let's bow our heads. I ask the worship team to come on up too. Heavenly Father, uh, what a great message. You are our King and you are returning soon. You went away and your, your, your servants, the angels said, He's coming again and every eye will see Him. He's coming to take all those who are His own. He's coming to restore His kingdom to fully to what it's supposed to be. A kingdom of joy and prosperity and justice where there will be healing for all who need it. And so God, right now we remember, we take this bread, we take this cup, and we remember that Christ, you are our king. And we examine our hearts right now and God, we have all failed you in in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds by things we have done, by things that we have left undone. We confess them to you now, right right now, Lord. And God, we prepare ourselves. We say sorry. We repent. We turn away from these things that are not pleasing to you. And we ask you to help us to walk in your way. We ask you to help us. Give us the strength to keep your presence on our hearts, in our minds, in our lives. We ask you to help us to be prepared for the King is returning soon and we want to be ready. You have called us not only your friends, you've called us your ambassadors. And God, we want to be ambassadors who are ready for your coming soon. Teach us, each of us in our own hearts, God, what are you asking us to do? How can we be ready for you? for 
forgiven sins are forgotten paid in full in you we are forgiven sins are forgotten paid in full in you we are forgiven sins are forgotten paid in full pray. God, right now we give thanks for the truth in those words. We think about your body. We think about your life, Jesus. That you laid down for us. And we give thanks right now. And we were told that we cannot live on bread alone by every word, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth. And so as we receive this bread now, we, we remember that physical food is not enough. We need you, Jesus. And so we eat this bread, receiving strength from you. Strength to be prepared. Strength to overcome. We thank you for your sacrifice for us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to peel back and uh, grab the wafer. The body of Christ, which is given for us, let's eat together. And Jesus, we give thanks for your blood that was shed. Paying a price that we could not pay ourselves. All of our sins washed away, forgiven, free, pure, and holy in the sight of you, God, because of the work of Christ. And so we receive your forgiveness now. We give thanks. And we stand prepared. We stand as your humble children your servants committing to you to give our lives because you first gave your life for us and so we drink now saying thank you for your forgiveness for your life your blood that was shed for us thank you this is the blood of Christ which is shed for us let's drink together worship team. Let's uh, bow our heads in prayer. God, right now we want to thank you not only for your sacrifice, but God, we want to pray right now, recognizing there are needs uh, in this congregation around the world, God. And God, we recognize that we aren't sure, God, sometimes what's going on in this world. And so we pray that you would help us to be calm when anxiety seems to be the order of the day, we ask you to help, uh, help us, God, to slow down and to remember that you are God and you will make things right in the end. Help us to reach out with our hearts when we can't touch with our hands. Help us to be connected socially even when we have to say, stay socially distant, help us to reach out to those in need, those who are lonely. Help us to pray with one another, God. Help us to uh, talk about you, Jesus. Help us to encourage each other, rem- reminding each other, God, of your great love. 
about the way you do come through for us. Help us, God, to remember love, that love casts out all fear, and that if we will love each other and love people, fear has no place in our lives. We do pray for the doctors, we pray for the nurses, for the technicians, the janitors, caregivers, researchers who are all trying to help us during COVID. Bless them, God. Keep them healthy and strong as well. For those who are sick, for those who are grieving, we pray for them, God, that you'll bring healing, that you'll bring the presence of your spirit. And God, that is one of my greatest prayers during COVID is, God, that you'll just bring our attention back to you. God, that you are loving Heavenly Father, that you do care about every aspect of our lives and that you are there for us. Help us to see that. Help us to see our need for you. In the meantime, God, when we live in this world, may we uh, feed the hungry, give drink to those who are thirsty, respond to the needs that you show us, God. May we walk with those who feel alone. May we do all that we can to bring healing, to help those who are fearful. Help us, O oh God, that we might help one another. And we pray all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Healer, and coming King. Amen. Well, when we talk about preparation, when we talk about being ready, uh, because the King is returning, uh, we come to our text today, with his, which is Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 to 18, and it, it kind of shows why we need to be prepared. So let me just right off read this. Uh, it's Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 to 18. So this is just after uh, Jesus had been born. The wise men, the Magi, had come to visit, had worshipped, had given their gifts to Jesus, and then they had gone off. And just after the, this, this is what happens. When, when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where they stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. May God bless his word this morning. So what's going on here? I mean, it's, it's quite a passage. I mean, what a tragedy. What a tragedy. And we can read the events and say, well, it's a good thing, Mary and Joseph, that they were attentive, that they were prepared. God spoke, and they went. They took off for Egypt to save the life of Jesus. There's a few things I want us to take note of in this passage. Uh, what's going on here? Well, number one, God protecting his plan. And I think this is an amazing thing. As, as many have before and many have after, people have tried to interfere with the plan of God. Herod tries to interfere with the plan of God here. Back in the time uh, of Moses, the Pharaoh tried to interfere with the plans of God. And God led his people out of slavery, out of Egypt, and into the promised land. Throughout the history, there have been people who have tried to interfere. Uh, in, in Germany, uh, Nazi Germany, they burned Bibles, they burned books, they tried to eradicate. There's been several times. Right now, it's going on in China. 
Uh, it's crazy what's going on in China. I'm not sure if any of you have read about this, but the Communist Party there have rewritten the Bible. And they've, they've changed it to make it um, go along with their own propaganda and their own philosophy. And it's terrible, the changes that they have made. But what they're trying to do is to stamp out biblical Christianity. Well, that's, how's that working out for the Chinese? <laughs> Not very well. Uh, the church in China is growing faster than almost anywhere in the world. And it's, it's underground. They have to keep kind of secret from the government, but it's growing strong. And here's the point, though, that God is protecting his plan. Nothing can stop it. Though God values our freedom to choose and doesn't interfere very often with our free, free will, he does intercede through circumstances, uh, through people, and he uses his knowledge and power to carry out his plan, his purpose for us in the world. Isaiah 14, 27 reads this. When it's, you know, here's where the prophet Isaiah was talking about, the coming of the Messiah. And then he says this, For the Lord Almighty has purposed, and who can thwart him? His hand is stretched out, and who can turn it back? I think it's an important thing for us to understand when we live our lives to understand that we better align ourselves with God's plan. Because nothing can stop it. Herod tried to eliminate the king of kings. But it wasn't going to happen. Psalm 33, 11 states, The plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. The same back then is the same right now. Nothing can stop the work of the Lord. So how do we respond? We better be in alignment with what God is doing. The second thing we see here is that when we cooperate with God and His plan, things work out for the good of those who love Him. Now, we don't get the whole story here. I don't want to give us the impression that, oh, we join God's team and everything in life is just smoothed out. Because we know that's not true. People can be completely committed and devoted to God and in this world, we still will have problems. We still have sickness. We still have relational issues. There are still natural disasters. Stuff happens, and it's not always good. But we have a God who loves us. And, and when we look at things in light of eternity, some of the little problems that we have in this world, if we think about it, they're not that bad. Even the really bad things in this world. Uh, I, I think all of you know, I, I've mentioned that my, my own dad is having problems right now. He has, he has dementia, and uh, it hasn't been fun the past, especially the past month or so. Uh, it's not fun. He, uh, I feel like my dad is gone. Uh, it doesn't even seem like I'm talking to him anymore. And right now, it just seems like, oh, this is so horrible. And in an earthly way, it is. But this I know. My dad's a follower of Jesus Christ. Up until his mind kind of has gotten kind of bad over the past year or so, uh, you know, he was uh, spending every day reading through. In the past few years, he's read through the entire Bible uh, over two, two, completely a couple times. And as he's been going later on in his life, he's been drawing closer to God. And now, you, to be honest, I don't really see that now in the past, you know, month or so. But in light of eternity, I know this, that like all of us will, my dad will pass on soon. And the king will return. He will establish his kingdom. And my dad will be there. And, and everything will be right upstairs again. <laughs> I mean, let's face it. People have told me that some things are not right with my brain too. And so I'm looking forward to when my own mind is, is made while well, I'm forgetting things. And, but perspective, people. Let's have an eternal perspective. And, and that's the thing about this. Mary and Joseph, God worked it out and we see, wow, they follow God and life was just a merry old way for them. I don't think so. Mary and Joseph, I think, had a pretty tough time. I don't know exactly what their trip to Egypt was like. They would have been strangers. They would have been foreigners. Uh, and we see when they came back to Nazareth, they never lived a rich life. I'm not sure if you, any, any of you read the article uh, lately, but... Uh, 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 archaeologist just said that he found the home of Jesus where he grew up. It's really silly to think that. Um, but he did find a household that was probably typical of the type that Jesus would live in. It was just a simple household in Nazareth. 
And uh, it's kind of cool, but Jesus lived a simple, humble life. And Mary and Joseph had a stigma on them. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. Um, Mary was ostracized because everybody thought that she had uh, Joseph, I mean, Jesus, out of wedlock. That perhaps it was a Roman soldier that had impregnated her. She had problems. Joseph had problems her whole life. But in the end, God's purpose and plan will work out. And it's the same with us people. In this world, we will have troubles. But when we cooperate with God in his plan, all will work out. And I think we need to keep that eternal perspective in our mind. Thirdly, we see Herod, representative, I think, of sinful humanity. He didn't know that they had fled to Egypt, but he did know that the Magi had tricked him, that they hadn't fallen for his ploy. They had outwitted him. And his response was anger and rage because he wanted Jesus dead. And so what did he do? He went into Bethlehem and he killed all the male children under two years old. What a horrific tragedy. Now, in some traditions, in the Catholic tradition, if you read, go on to Wikipedia or some other Catholic site, you'll, they'll say that the number could be uh, 14,000. In some uh, uh, old traditions, it was 64,000 or 128,000 kids. Uh, probably not. Uh, historically, we do know that Bethlehem was probably a town of under 300 people. Under 300 people. So there was probably 40 or so kids only about probably 15 to 20 males, probably, in the surrounding area about that age. Not that that makes it any easier for the families, the mothers, the fathers that lost their kids. But my point is that we see in Herod the reason why Jesus had to come. Maybe because of Herod's power and his authority that he could get away with anything. We see his sinfulness, his wickedness at even a higher level. But the truth is that this is the nature of humanity, that we are selfish. We do things that are going to be good for us, for our family, for our well-being, for our power, for our wealth, for our whatever. What's good for me? What's good for me? And so we see here the sinfulness of humanity. What we learn from this is that it was a cold, hard world that Jesus was born into. And that was why Jesus had to come. So things could be different. We see the selfishness mankind is capable of. John 3, 19 says this, This is the judgment that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. We all see it around the world all the time. And sometimes we just don't think of it as evil because it's in little ways. In little ways. Bullying, a little bit of corruption here and there, or in the case of Canadian government, a lot of corruption, but we won't get into that. (laughs) Actually, actually, it's kind of funny. Actually, uh, traveling overseas is pretty funny because I get so ticked off at Canadian politics, but all you need to do is travel overseas and you recognize that actually it's not so bad in Canada, the corruption. But it's there still. And that's the thing. We just learn to, oh yeah, but just overlook it. It's just the way the world is. Politicians are corrupt. You know, and everything else. It's human nature to be selfish, to love the darkness more than the light. But Jesus came to buy us forgiveness. He came because we could not fix things on our own. The Acts of Herod remind us how much we have a need for a Savior. Then the passage goes on, eventually, still listening to God, Mary and Joseph bring back Jesus to Israel when it was safe. And following God's lead, they raise him in Nazareth. Again, uh, for those of us that went to Israel last year, it's amazing going to this little place and recognize. It's funny growing up and thinking, oh, Nazareth. It must be such a cool place. That's where Jesus was brought up. And then you go there and it's, oh. What a little hovel. You know, it's just a little rural, very rustic community. Even still today, and back then it was the same thing. Just a very rural, agricultural area. But it was a fulfillment of prophecy that uh, Jesus would be raised in Nazareth, and that's where they raised him. 
So even in this tragic story, we see the basics, the whole story of the gospel. We see man's sinfulness. We see God's intervention. And we see man's hope of salvation only comes from being on God's side, being prepared and listening to him. And for his part, he gives us the forgiveness. When we give, us, when we give him our allegiance, our obedience, he gives us forgiveness and a place in his kingdom. So it's amazing when you think of that story. It has really the whole story of mankind. In Herod, we do see the wickedness that is in our world, and we don't need to look around for her to see it. But God will always intervene for his people. John chapter 1, verse 9 to 12 says this, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. It's that simple. It's not some list of good works that we have to do. God is not weighing the, the right and the wrong, the good and the evil that we do. He is saying this, come to me. Come to me. Recognize that I'm your God. Be in relationship with me. Receive me, as it says, to all who did receive him. He gave the right to become children of God. Come. Recognize the right order of the world. That God is creator. We are not creator. Come back to him. He's the king. We are not the king. Recognize that. And you can be part of my family. And you can have forgiveness. You can have joy. Healing of of everything. We can all have that. We can become children of God. And so I ask us this morning, are we prepared? Are we prepared? Our hearts need to be right with God. Again, not that we have to be perfect, but we have to be committed. We have to say, yes, God, I recognize that I I can't do it. We are not in control. You are in control. And that I give you my allegiance. Mary and Joseph, this story of them fleeing to Egypt shows the entire gospel in that one little story. And I pray for it. My prayer for us today is that we will recognize our need and we will recognize that God intervenes when we give our life to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this story of an outrageous tragedy reminds me of the reality in our world. Things like this, though it probably was only 15, 20 little boys that were killed, that's too many. And God, we become complacent, we become desensitized to all the evil things that happen around the world. We just say, oh yeah, that's just the way it is. But God, I ask you to help us to see the wrong, the evil in the world. Help us to see clearly, open our eyes to see what it is. It's simply rebelling against you, God. You created us to look after this world with you not against you. God, mankind has said, sorry, God, we don't need you. God, I pray this story in your word will remind us that it's not true. We cannot do it without you, God. And so, God, I pray that you would help us to be ready to receive you and to be prepared for your coming again. You are always there, ready to speak to us, ready to guide us. When we have attentive ears. So God, like Mary and Joseph, help us to have attentive ears, to be ready to hear from you, to be ready to obey. Because all will work out in the end when we are listening to you. God, this Christmas season, I pray we will be ready that we will celebrate, that we will have fun, that we will have joy with our family and friends as much as we can. 
but God, that mostly we will remember that Jesus Christ, God in flesh, He came because we need Him, that we can't live, we cannot succeed, and we certainly don't have eternal life without God, without His sacrifice. So teach us this, I pray, and I pray, God, you'll give us the strength. Uh, Holy Spirit, lay it on our minds that we will be prepared people. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, God bless you, everyone. Thank you so much, all of you who are watching online. God bless you and keep you and keep you safe. Have yourselves a wonderful week. We're dismissed.